In part two of module seven, we're going to look at decision-making processes. More specifically, we'll look at the decision-making process, as well as some errors and biases that individuals bring to decision-making and issues that emerge around ethical decision-making. I'm going to outline a five-step decision-making process like with some of the other content, I do want to flag that the number of steps varies from text to text, and some include more details in this framework, but they do tend to follow this kind of process. The first step is about identifying and defining what it is that you want to make a decision about. What is the problem? The trick is that you really want to get to the base problem that needs a decision, rather than focusing on just symptoms or parts of the problem. The Harvard case study approach is an approach that people often learn in business courses as a method for sorting out problems from symptoms. In the process of identifying and defining a problem, inevitably you will need information. Not all information will be useful in helping to make a decision. Useful information needs to give insight into the benefits of the decision, the costs of the decision, as well as being available when it's needed and being acceptable to the people who need to use it. It needs to be judged as sound and sensible. The second step is about coming up with different possible courses of action, the pros and cons of different courses of action. This step can be helped by creativity and diversity of opinions to generate as many possible courses of action. Of course, it's not enough to just come up with the options, but to carefully consider what is good and what is bad about each option to provide a careful evaluation to help inform decision making. Some decision making processes advise adopting an almost mathematical approach to this step, allocating different weights to each option. The third step doesn't have much to it, but it can be difficult for some to do in practice. It simply involves choosing the best option based on the information that you have at hand. The fourth step concerns the implementation of decisions. In order for implementation to occur, it needs the acceptance and participation of anyone affected by the decision. For example, managers can decide to purchase and implement a new software system, but if the people that work in the organisation refuse to use the new software system, or learn how to use the software system, then the decision won't be implemented. Finally, the last step of the decision-making process involves evaluating how effective the decision was in order to make the best possible decisions in the future. Sometimes this involves a formal after-action review. As you might have noticed, this process is actually a cycle rather than a linear process, with final evaluation sometimes requiring a return to earlier steps in the decision-making process if the decisions were found to be inadequate. The decision-making process is fraught with problems and errors. As part of the human condition, people come up with shortcuts to help them make decisions more quickly and easily. These shortcuts are called heuristics. These shortcuts can create errors and biases in the decision-making process. This slide shows a whole lot of the different kinds of errors and biases that can come up. I won't go through each one of them here. I'll just give some examples of a few of them. Let's start with the anchoring and adjustment effect. So anchoring and adjustment refers to decision makers focusing on the initial information they have to make their decisions, despite any information that might follow. Effectively, people make decisions based on their first impressions. So, for example, if a manager takes over a group of employees and on the very first day one of the employees is having a bad day and performs very poorly, but every day after that the employee is an exemplary employee and performs really well. If that manager then bases decisions about what work to give that person or their chances of promotion based on their initial bad impression, they are introducing an anchoring bias into the decision making. It doesn't need to be a bad impression, it might be an initially good impression that isn't held up by the facts later. Framing is a bias we come across all the time and it's essentially the way in which information is presented that influences the way information is interpreted and therefore the subsequent decisions that are informed by that information. One place we can see examples of framing every day is in the news, particularly if coverage of the same news item by different sources is compared. In 
print news, it could be the use of different headlines. If one newspaper has a negative angle in the headline, while another gives a positive headline, the rest of the article can be identical, but those headlines can give a whole different feel to the information. Similarly, on TV news, not only the language and whether it's positive or negative, but the lighting, how much colour is used, or the kind of music can help to frame the information and influence the way that information is interpreted and used. Another problem can be with escalating commitment, and this concerns the problem that can occur when a decision has been made, but it proves it to be a bad decision, and the manager refuses to accept that it's a bad decision, and keeps putting more and more resources, money, time, effort, and people into supporting that original decision. So, for example, if a manager decides to partner with a particular organisation, believing that it will lead to an increase in customers' profit and reputation, but then the partnership doesn't bring new customers, and it turns out that the product that the partner was chosen for is actually not a good product and is giving the company a bad name, escalating commitment would occur if the manager keeps giving the partnership more money to improve the product, allocating more people to help out the partnership, and refusing to acknowledge that it might be cheaper and more effective simply to end the partnership. And finally, I'm going to look at groupthink. Groupthink is slightly different from the other types of biases and errors listed here, as it concerns errors that happen in the way groups make decisions rather than just individuals. Groupthink refers to the pressure that can happen in a group for everyone to agree, even if there is information or different perspectives that provide a more complete picture that would result in better decisions. Sometimes it's called having a hive mind. Groupthink is more likely to occur in highly cohesive groups with lack of impartial leadership where group members are very similar and the context is very stressful with external threats on the group. A commonly used example of groupthink is NASA's 1980s Challenger disaster where a faulty component led to a manned mission exploding. In that case groupthink was blamed for a lack of identification of the faulty component. An important part of decision making is the need for decisions to be ethical. Ethics concerns beliefs or principles that guide behaviour about what is right or wrong. An ethical dilemma refers to a particular decision making condition where an individual must make a decision but it's not clear what decision is right and what decision is wrong. And so because of this it's up to the individual to make a good decision. Often in these situations there can be the potential for gain or benefit, such as making a profit, but in a way that is also unethical. For example, profit at the expense of the health and safety of employees. Other times an ethical dilemma may involve making a decision that requires a choice between actions where whatever the choice will result in a negative consequence to someone. Ethical dilemmas often arise unexpectedly and create a large amount of stress for the individuals involved, challenging their moral values. The difficulty is that what is considered ethical or moral changes from person to person and situation to situation. Philosophers have classified different kinds of value systems as utilitarian, where decisions are made that produce the greatest good for the greatest number of people, as moral rights, where ethical decisions are those that best maintain and protect fundamental rights, such as the right to privacy, or Philosophers have classified moral values in terms of a justice model, where ethical decisions are concerned with distributing benefits and harms in a fair or impartial way. Different factors that can influence the way that an individual deals with ethical dilemmas include personal influences like their family values, their religious values, their own personal standards and integrity, as well as personal needs. We've all read of stories about people stealing out of desperation because the personal need for safe food or security outweighs ethical or legal considerations. Another factor is the organisation itself, the formal policies and procedures, codes of conduct, as well as the more informal cultural practices. For example, some football clubs have poor organisational cultures where poor behaviour from male players towards women are accepted. Also, poor ethical decisions are often made when individuals in the company are under intense pressure to perform. Finally, the broader environment beyond the organisation can impact on how individuals will handle ethical dilemmas, such as government laws and regulations, as well as the norms and values of the country at that point in time. So, for example, Australia has reasonably extensive occupational health and safety laws, while some other countries don't. 
There are some common sources of ethical dilemmas, including discrimination, where decisions are made based on criteria that's not really relevant to the job at hand, such as race, religion or gender. They can also come from sexual harassment, where individuals feel uncomfortable because of inappropriate comments and actions that are sexual in nature. They might occur from conflicts of interest, where a manager takes a bribe, a kickback or extraordinary gift in, in return for making a decision favourable to the gift giver. They can come from customer confidence, where a manager has privileged information regarding the activities of a customer and shares that information with another party. And finally, it can come from organisational resources, where organisational resources are used for personal activities, such as using company emails to express personal opinions. Individuals that behave unethically and make unethical decisions usually convince themselves that what they're doing is not wrong. Researchers have identified some common reasons or rationales that individuals use to justify poor behaviour. First, individuals convince themselves that the behaviour and decision making is not really illegal. For example, bribery is not legal in Australia, but is common practice in other countries. So, if an expatriate receives a bonus for getting contracts in a particular country, and they can ensure a contract for their company through a commonly used practice of giving a bribe, then the expatriate may argue that it is okay to bribe officials because bribery is not really illegal in that country. Second, individuals might convince themselves that because there is benefit for some, like themselves or their company, then their decision and action is in everyone's best interest. Third, individuals sometimes convince themselves that nobody will ever find out. This particularly happens when there's a lack of accountability and transparency in the workplace about what people are doing. Students that plagiarise, where they present someone else's work as their own, often use this rationalisation. Finally, individuals sometimes convince themselves that the organisation will look after them if things go wrong. For example, individuals that work for gambling companies that were detained in China might have mistakenly thought their employer would protect or help them if they got into trouble. So how might organisations go about helping people that work for them to address ethical dilemmas appropriately? There are a few different strategies that have been identified that work with varying degrees of success. First, developing a checklist as a framework for helping to make ethical decisions can be helpful. If you look over these six steps, you might notice that they are a bit similar to the decision-making process. First, it's important to recognise that there is an ethical dilemma. Diagnose the problem. Second, ensuring the decisions are based on facts helps not only in making the decisions, but demonstrating on what basis you made the decisions. Third, the legal, moral and societal implications of the decision need to be considered. Once a decision is made, then building a specific step to consider the ethics of the decision can be helpful. Sometimes thinking about how you would feel if people close to you found out, or if it was publicly known, can help to provide clarity. Finally, the last part of addressing ethical dilemmas is that people are responsible and accountable for the decisions they make. So, as well as a checklist for making ethical decisions, there are a few other ways that organisations can try to ensure ethical decision making in their organisations. Organisations might develop and use a code of ethics, which is a formal statement of the rules and standards expected of people within the organisation. The Code of Ethics might incorporate organisational ethical standards as well as those from within that industry or profession, such as doctors having their own Code of Ethics. Whether or not a Code of Ethics will actually improve how ethical decision making actually is will depend on whether it is actually used. Another strategy that organisations might use is to provide individuals within the organisation with ethics training, where people are given structured training programs to help develop high standards of ethical behaviour and decision making. Finally, a legal protection that exists in Australia is that of whistleblower legislation. Whistleblowers are those that expose the misdeeds of others in the organisation and play an important role in protecting ethical standards. Whistleblower legislation is supposed to protect individuals that speak out about unethical practices from retaliation from their workplace. Some workplaces build in policies, procedures and personnel to actively support whistleblowers and protect their anonymity. This brings us to the end of our lecture on decision making.